Okay, recording is on. Take it away. Thank you, Barbara. Let us join now in our call to worship as it's printed in your bulletin or found in those materials that were mailed or emailed to you today. The let the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and a pure heart, who do not lift up their soul to what is false, and do not swear deceitfully. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God of their salvation. Such is the company of all who see him. Seek the face of the God of Jacob. Be with those who seek you today, O Lord. Amen. Now Jeff will share with us the hymn today, What Gift Can We Bring? Thank you, Jeff. Let us continue now in a spirit of prayer as we join together in the congregational prayer that you have before you, saying together, O oh God in heaven, 
you give us choices. We can choose to remain in our sin because we are comfortable there, or we can choose to receive your grace and presence with us. You have chosen to send your only son to offer that gift to us, that gift of forgiveness, if we would but choose to receive it. We know in our heart of hearts that remaining in our sin is pulling us farther from our relationship with you. Turn our desire toward you, O Lord, and away from our sin. Help us to praise you like King David with all his might, with abandon and without pride, giving all he had within him to praise your name. For you, O Lord, deserve our praise without reserve. The gift of your Son is immeasurable for us. Your grace is more than sufficient for us to turn away from our sin and toward your love. Help us, O Lord, to receive your love and grace with a joy that is unfettered. In the precious name of our Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. As we continue in prayer, I would ask, as we usually do, if there are those we need to add to our list this morning that have not made it this week or have recently come to our attention. Jeannie? Okay, Bob, um, declining health um, and the family rallying to his side. Are there others? Yes, Nancy is on our list. My niece, Meredith. Barbara Meredith. Last night. I mean, yesterday she was on her way from the Cape to Maine and had to pull over in Peabody because she was in such pain and had emergency gallbladder surgery. Ooh. In a strange place, huh? Yep. Well, she was able to go to Leahy, which is a good thing. Okay, well, we'll certainly keep Meredith in our prayers. Is she still in the hospital? I think she was going home last night. I'm waiting for an update. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll we'll wait with bated breath for that update. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Are there others? Yes, Cheryl. Can we <laughs> Celebrate Samantha, yes, indeed we can. And home meaning staying around for a while, right? <laughs> School is all done. You've just been working, okay. Well, yes, yes, we can celebrate the coming birth for sure. All right, seeing no others, let us continue on in a spirit of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your presence with us this morning. We thank you that you have come to be with us through your Son and through your Spirit. We thank you that we are united through that Spirit as a family of God. And we see you, Heavenly Father, as our Father and long to be with you forever where you are in time. 
Lord, we do thank you for your presence with us in emergencies, especially as you were with Meredith and uh, her interrupted trip to Maine for gallbladder surgery. And Lord, we know that you are present with Bob as the family is coming to be by his side as he's, his health is declining. So we, we ask for your presence with those who are traveling. And we thank you for Samantha's presence with us today and for the new life that she is bringing into this world soon. We thank you that uh, you have blessed her with a new uh, place to stay and to live and to work. We ask for your continued presence and guidance for her as she goes forth. And Lord, we have an extensive list. We ask that you would be with all of those who we continue to pray for. For we know that you know each of the needs that are expressed there. And you know exactly how to meet those needs. So we trust that that will happen in your name. And we thank you, Lord, that you have sent your son to be among us, to offer us the gift of grace, the gift of forgiveness, the gift of love and presence through the Holy Spirit. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you because he came and because he lived and he died and he rose again after death. And Lord, he taught us while we were here how to pray. So let us enter into that prayer that he taught us together saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, as we um, take our offering this morning, we invite Jeff to share again with his eye is on the sparrow.
and I know he watches me. Amen is right. Amen and amen. God is always watching us, ever vigilant, all the time. Praise God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time to gather, for this time to bring our gifts to you. We ask, Lord, that you would touch those gifts in ministry that flows from us to the world around us. We thank you that you have given us the means to give back to you and ask that those gifts would be multiplied as only you can do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now I'm going to invite my wife to come home and come home up here <laughs> and read our um, gospel this morning and that is found in um, Mark chapter 6 verses 14 through 29. King Herod heard of it for Jesus name had become known. Some were saying John the baptizer has been raised from the dead and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because Herod had married her, for John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man and protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you and even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? And she replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oath and the guest, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guards with orders to bring John's head. Mm -hmm. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When the disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid him in the tomb. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay. Thank you. Not a story that we often hear in Sunday school. Um, but the Bible doesn't mince words a lot of times. Uh, we get everything that uh, um, pertains to life if we look hard enough through those words. Now, as we prepare for our Old Testament scripture, I'll ask Jeff to come back and share with us the Lord of the dance. Mm -hmm. 
I danced in the morning when the world was become, and I danced in the moon and the stars and the sun came down from heaven and I danced on earth at Bethlehem I had my birth dance then wherever you may be I am the Lord of the dance said he and I'll lead you all wherever you may be and I'll lead you all in the dance said he I danced on a Friday and the sky turned black it's hard to dance with the devil on your back. They buried my body and they thought I'd gone. But I am the dance and I still go on. Dance then wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all wherever you may be. And I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. Amen. I'll lead you on in the dance, said he. Hallelujah. I kind of got my blood moving a little bit. So thank God for that. And as we approach the scripture this morning, I just have a few notes about that. Uh, we, we learn in this scripture today about the ark of God and some of its travels. The origin of the ark dates back to the days when the Israelites were wandering in the desert after their deliverance from Egypt. It was the sacred vessel that Moses himself received the design for from God on top of Mount Sinai when he received those 10 commandments from God. It was the place believed by the Israelites to be the home of God on earth, containing those very stone tablets which God, on which God wrote the commandments. It was designed to be mobile with rods at its base to carry it about wherever the people traveled. And it indeed had various homes throughout uh, the time that uh, the Israelites wandered around the desert. And one of those homes just before this story we hear this morning was the house of Obed-Edom in the hill country in the house of Abinadab after being moved from Shiloh when that city was captured by an enemy of Israel. And it was moved by David from there when he was establishing Jerusalem as the religious center for Israel, in addition to being both the military and political center of the land. And we also read about David being clad in a linen ephod. And the linen ephod of David's day was a, a priestly garb that only covered the front of the body and didn't wrap around it as later garments developed by the priests for their duties did. So David wore the ephod as a symbol of his anointing as a priestly leader, as well as political and military leader of God's people. He led the people as priests in the sacrifices he made at each stop of the journey, all the way to Jerusalem with the ark. So here now, the story of those travels from 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, and 12b through 19. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. David and all the people with him set out and went from Baal Judah to bring up the ark 
from there, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. They carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzziah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God. And Ahio went in front of the ark. David and all the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all their might. With songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. The Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. The people were celebrating. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fatling. David danced before the Lord with all his might. David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting. And with the sound of the trumpet, as the ark of God came into the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord and despised him in her heart. They brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and offerings of well-being before the Lord. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the offerings of well-being, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed food among all the people, the whole multitude of Israel both men and women, to each a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins. Then all the people went back to their homes. Well, the sermon today is called David Danced with All His Might. What a procession that must have been. 30,000 men of the army of Israel marching with the Ark of God, with the king leading the way. The Ark had been mounted on a new cart, and the sons of the man in whose house it had been residing until then were guiding it with their oxen pulling the weight. Only six paces into the journey, and sacrifices were called for. This was the home of God, after all, and the people had to express their awe and praise with sacrifice in those days. It was their way of communicating with God and acknowledging their humility before God. It was a procession infused with joy. The presence of God with his people was a blessing that had to be expressed in every way from the heart. Dance was a long tradition to the people of Israel, dating all the way back to Miriam, the sister of Moses and Aaron, who celebrated with the women of Israel their deliverance from the soldiers of Egypt after they had drowned in the sea through which the people had just passed on dry ground. 
They recognize the hand of God in their safety with joyous song and dance. And the people of Israel were even dancing for joy before the golden calf when Moses returned from the mountain after receiving the Ten Commandments. Though they were directing their joy wrongly, as we all know. It was not uncommon in those days to express their joy in the Lord with dance. And David is a perfect example of that in this passage. He was so full of the presence of God before the ark that represented all that God was to the people of Israel that he couldn't stand still. In the parlance of a modern movie, he had happy feet. His joy could not be contained in a static pose. He could not sit quietly in church before the Lord. He was so full of the presence of God that it overflowed from him in movement. So he danced with all his might. When you think about it a bit though, isn't joy best expressed in dance? When there is a wedding feast, in addition to all the food that we usually have, there's usually dances of joy. And in a modern musical movie, there's usually a great band of dancers that give credence to the joy in the script. We dance when we receive good news, some of us better than others, like getting accepted to the college of our choice or the new life growing in one about to have a baby or the birth of that new life. The engagement of a couple desiring to make a life together, all could be enough to cause dance to break out in celebration. And what could be more fulfilling than being filled with God's own spirit to cause one to dance? That was David in this procession to Jerusalem. He danced with abandon before the Lord and apparently clothed with only a linen garment that didn't cover all of him. Think of a hospital gown. And when his wife, Michael, saw him coming into town in such a frenzy, she was horrified and berated him mightily for it. The following verses in this passage that we read today speak more to her rebuke and David's reaction to it and make some interesting reading. And her own backstory is another interesting read from the first book of Samuel in chapter 18. You'd like to check that out later. But it wasn't only David's dance that drew attention but there seemed to be many musicians and others who danced with the king who accompanied the procession. It says in verse five here, David and all the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all their might, with songs and lyres and harps, and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. This was not a reserved group that accompanied the ark of God. They were singing as well as dancing and playing upon the stringed instruments and banging on the cymbals and clapping the castanets and jingling the tambourines. All those who were in the path would know that they were coming. 
there could be no discounting the joy in that procession. It was like the worship found in the last Psalm of our Bible, which says, praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty firmament, which surrounds that sanctuary. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his surpassing greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipes. Praise him with clanging cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now that is praise that gets the blood pumping. Praise with a lot of exclamation points. The kind of praise you might find in a Pentecostal service at the beginning when the music is blasting and the hands are raised in praise and the feet are moving to the beat of the music. The kind of praise you might find in one of those fringe sects of Christendom where leaders are handling poisonous snakes in a state of ecstasy as they try to summon the Holy Spirit as a protector of the people and I'm sure themselves. I found myself at services where the music is trying to evoke a response from the congregation before the preacher gets up to harangue that congregation with warnings to turn from their wayward ways and praise God from a pure and forgiven heart. And that's not such a bad message. But as a staid and prudish New England United Methodist, I find it hard to move out of my shell and demonstrate God's love to others in that way. Or more appropriately, to demonstrate my love of God in that way. And even if I could, it would probably evoke a response from those who witnessed it, similar to that response from Michael, David's wife and the daughter of Saul, a response of disgust or perhaps scorn if one wanted to be a little more kind. So what's holding us back? Are we afraid of what others would say about it if we remain silent in our seats? Or maybe we have not experienced God in a way that would evoke such a response. That would evoke such a response that we wouldn't care about what others said. Maybe we only know God in that way on those mountaintop times when he fills us with such joy that we can't help ourselves. I've been there on the top of a mountain, literally witnessing the sunrise and the many colors that accompanied it, moved mightily by God. I've been there while recovering from my heart attacks and composing music telling the story of the resurrection being filled myself as I thought of it. I've even been there when I was only the only one in the sanctuary or the service. Now, maybe I didn't dance, but I felt the move of God and could have. So God has to move us in some way, if not to dance, at least to praise. We gather each Sunday to renew our strength, to meet God from wherever we are on our journey that morning, 
and gain life for our relationship with God. Or maybe more appropriately to gain life in our relationship with God. If we can't dance with our feet, we must dance with our hearts. God is worth that dance, that praise. That is our worship. So by all means, let's dance. Amen. <laughs> and sing too. Amen. <laughs> Speaking of singing, we'll invite Jeff. Um, you do have the words on the back of your bulletin to, to these songs. So you can maybe sing quietly to yourself while Jeff is leading us. For those at home, Feel free to belt it out. Send forth by God's blessing, our true faith confessing, the people of God from this dwelling take leave. The service is ended, or oh, now be extended, the fruits of our worship in all who believe. The seed of our teaching, receptive souls reaching, shall blossom in action for God and for all. God's grace did invite us, and love shall unite us work for God's kingdom and answer the call. With praise and thanksgiving to God ever living, the tasks of our everyday life we will face. Our faith ever sharing, in love ever caring, embracing God's children of each tribe and race. With your grace you'll feed us, with your light thou lead us, unite us as one in this life that we share. There may all be living with praise and thanksgiving, give honor to Christ and that name which we bear. Thank you, Jeff. Let us now into, enter into our congregational prayer for renewal, where we begin to honor God with that praise on this point. Let us pray, O God of hosts, be with us. We seem to have drifted far from your truth. Bring us back, O Lord to you as center in our lives. Be for us the one true God who created the world and everything in it, including ourselves. Reveal to us your power and glory. Fill us with your presence that we may go from here full of your spirit, ready to bring the world together in peace and joy, for we need your strength. We need your grace. We need your love in us so that we can spread it in our world this week. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. Now may the God who resides in heaven and looks down upon us as his beloved children, and Jesus Christ, whom God sent from there to die for our sins, and now sits with God there. And the Holy Spirit that Jesus sent when he returned to heaven, that Holy Spirit that lives within your heart, 
be with you now and move you to dance and to sing and to praise God with all joy. Amen.